All right. Well, I have the privilege of sitting in front of an old Davis Cup mate of mine who's um, well, become a bit of a tennis coaching guru. For, well, not just has become. It has been for a long time. Uh, Darren Cahill. Judy Kashi. Um, hey, you've, you've had a... You're, uh, we're sitting here in Singapore, the beautiful uh, Marina Bay Hotel with mm-hmm. some, some background music mm-hmm. and an empty cafe, but you're here for... Uh, business. Monica, for business. Yeah, yeah. Simona. Yep. Simona Hallett. And um, uh, she's in the finals here for... Um, well, it's the second time, isn't it? Third time. Third, Third time. time in a row. Yeah. Second time with you. That's great, yeah. And you've had a, you've had a decent bout of... Um, if I'm correct, you are the youngest, you're the, the coach who got Leighton Hewitt to number one, is the youngest number one ever, yeah. and Andre Agassi is the oldest, oldest number one. Correct, yeah, he was 33 in about seven or eight months, uh, oldest ever number one to hold that ranking in, in the open era. Mm. Uh, we had some pretty amazing, especially the Aussie players, amazing players uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Um, Kenny Rosewell made the final of Wimbledon when he was 39 years of age. Mm. Conan's made a pretty good run there as well. But Andre at 33 in about seven months made the number one ranking in 2003. And so, yeah, it means you have a couple of great horses in both Leighton and Andre. So I got pretty lucky with him. Yeah. Now, Leighton I can understand a little bit because uh, obviously growing up, growing up in South Australia. Yep. Um, how did that come about? And, and um, yeah, how did that come about? Yeah. <laughs> with Rusty, uh, he was about 12 or 13. I just finished with my knees, and uh, I was about 28, 29. When are we, okay, well, I got to just elaborate here. When you say you're finished with, with your knees. With my knees, I had knee, about 12 knee operations. You were a bit operations. like me. How, yeah. many, how many did you have? About 12 knee operations before I was 25. <laughs> 12. So at 25, I went in for quite a big operation, never really recovered. Mm. I came back about three years later, played for about six months, and at Wimbledon, uh, snapped my knee again, and that was it. So I was mm. done. But... Um, career finished a little bit short which gave me an opportunity to do a little more coaching back home and got lucky that I got a phone call from Leighton's parents that they had a young fella that played pretty well was an Adelaide boy loved Andre Agassi at that stage uh, turned up on my door knocked on my door this little kid was about five foot tall lightning fast 12 years of age had eight Prince tennis rackets in his racket bag had the hat backwards had the long shorts like Agassi and we went out the back and we started hitting balls, which I'd done for quite a few players back in South Australia, but this kid stood out straight yeah. away. So he was really well coached. He had a great coach in Peter Smith, yep. who's worked with a lot of players back in South Australia. So my role really with him was to teach him how to play, what shots to hit uh, yeah. from certain positions to uh, when to be competitive, so how to, to play win. the school, to, how to win, yeah. to, to, to be most effective on the court with a game that he had. Um, he, he was a little bit limited with the way he played back then. He was very cross-court orientated, so trying to get him to take the ball down the line wasn't in his repertoire. Uh, I remember one drill that we used to do was he really never wanted to take the forehand down the line, and even in juniors it got him into trouble. So his dad was a decent, foot, a very good footballer, but a decent tennis player. So I used to, and he and his dad used to go at it all the time. So I used to do the cross-court drill, as everybody does, but I used to sick his dad up at the net so make Leighton hit the ball down the line and he used to try to take his head off. <laughs> and it actually forced Leighton to be aggressive with the forehand down the line and we'd do it non-stop. He'd try to drill that ball straight through his dad's chest and it worked into a, one of the best shots he had, that forehand down the line. When it set up for him, Leighton would launch himself into it and it became a, a staple of his game. Mm. It's actually it's funny, just, um, just thinking about the, that, uh, the, the down the line shot in tennis. Uh, when I worked with Philip Pousses, yeah. Um, it's it's funny how I mean you you'll you'll laugh at this, but it's funny how all of a sudden you 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 come and you change somebody's game. All I did is like she mate started the backhand down the line instead of cross court, yeah. and he had a big backhand as you know. Mm-hmm. Next thing you know, he's opening the court up and yeah. smacking forehand winners. Yeah. Uh, it's just spotting a, a little thing like that, but the down the line shot. Mm-hmm. That's that's my 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 staples because probably didn't have a lot of top spin hook the ball out. Yeah, but it seems to be a really under underrated shot. Yeah, it was always the toughest shot in tennis to play mm. because you know we grew up in the era where you cut down on the unforced errors. It was tough to hit winners back in our day because of the, the rackets and everything that you played with. So you really played the percentages. And as racket technology improved, string technology improved, for me the first player that really hurt me when I played was Lendl with both the backhand down the line and the forehand down. You played him many, many times. You beat him a number of times. I never got close to him on the court. But quite often you knew where he was going with the shot, but you still couldn't get there because he hit the ball so hard. So for me, he was 
the toughest guy I played where I really felt like the down the line shots were incredibly effective if you had the game to play him. And then I think Agassi took it to another level from that level with both the forehand and backhand down the line. And now everybody does it. You, you have to have it in today's game to be effective. If you don't have an effective down the line shot from either wing, uh, you'll get found out. Mm. Well, speaking of Andre, for me, when I, when I saw Andre playing, and um, he he was incredible. Voice of, for me, he turned defense into attack. Yeah. I've never seen anybody do that like yeah. like he did. I mean, he didn't back off. You know, most guys were on the run, and they had a sh- somebody had a short ball. You'd be backtracking and you know hoping to scramble the ball and hit a lob. You know, he stood up on the baseline. Yeah, I mean, there's. Is it just hand-eye coordination? Was it something that he sort of learned? Uh, was it something he just, he just... How did he develop that? Well, I give a lot of credit to his dad. His dad brought him up on this... He called it... Uh, what was it? The devil or something he oh, called it? The yeah. machines, the, the ball the, machines the ball that machine he used one. to grow yeah. up. And, and the dragons. The dragons. He'd get up every morning and face the dragons and his dad would make him hit a couple of hundred balls and he'd put him on the baseline and he'd develop short back swings because of the fact of the way he practiced in those early years. So that was something that was ingrained in him. And his dad was responsible for that. And then as coaches came along, they sort of evolved his game to become what it was. You know, for me, Andre was different in the sense, you're 100% right, he never backed off. You know, tennis is played, I think, in three zones. You have the green zone, which is the zone just inside the baseline, which is the attack zone. If you move inside the baseline, then you're ready to attack. And you have the yellow zone, which is sort of from the baseline and about six feet behind it. Sort of the meat and potato zone where you do a lot of the work and try to get above neutral in the shots. And then the defense zone, which is the red zone, six feet and further back from the baseline. Now, Andre never went there, mm. ever. You, you can never get him into the red zone. And that's the way he played early in his career. But I think as he became a, a smarter tennis player and more effective tennis player, and I give Brad Gilbert a lot of credit for this, he started to use those zones more effectively. And the two things he did is he did drift back to the red zone to return serve. Remember back in our day when we played him, he never backed off mm. on a return of serve. Mm. It got him into trouble as well because yeah. he also got aced a lot. He wasn't didn't have a big reach on the return of serve, so he had to guess yeah. on the return of serve. And as he got a little bit older and smarter, he did start to back off a little bit, start to give himself a little more time to read the serve, use the slice backhand a little more effectively, and let the game of tennis come to him. He didn't stay in the red zone for very long, but he was willing to go back there to serve a purpose. And then his big thing was when he came into the green zone, everything for him was an attackable ball. Mm. Everything was a chance to hit a winner. And I think as he got older, he got a little bit smarter, is that he didn't try to overhit the ball when he got into that green zone. He, had, he, he tried to make his opponent run more and looked at it as a working shot. So I think that was a real evolution of the way he played. He started to use the zones of the tennis court much better than he did when he was younger. When he was younger, everything, he stayed in the yellow zone, in the green zone, and everything was a chance to hit a winner. Smack the hell out of Yeah, so if he had a bad day, he would lose to players that he should never lose to. Mm. But as he got older, he didn't lose those matches. He became a, a smarter and more educated player. Mm. Um, the older player, uh, we're seeing quite a lot of those. Well, only a few years ago, we were, t- we were talking about even less than a few, a couple yeah. of years ago. Oh, the, the new 20 years is, the th- is 30. Yeah. Uh, you know, with Federer playing so well and... Uh, you know, Leighton and uh, and uh, various players doing still doing incredibly well in, the, in their thirties. Um, Andre, I'm interested in Andre because he wasn't particularly fast, but he no. used to cover read the game well, really read the game well, and cover the, yep. the court well. Do you think being up near the baseline helped that helped him be able to cover the, cover the court? Or do you think it was just a natural thing? You know what? I have a few thoughts on this, and I go back and forth on, on a number of them. I think, to a large extent, the elimination of serve and volley has helped extend a lot of players' careers because, as you know, playing serve and volley is brutal, yeah. difficult on the body. Yeah. And I don't think people realise how difficult it is to get up and explode into your serve, yeah. take the first two or three steps, hit the pivot step, and then lunge and dive and get down for that first volley and do that three or four hundred times per match. Yeah. It just, it rips the life out of your body. Oh, and the, the, your surgeon and my surgeon yeah, will agree on that. And we're not the only ones. You look through some of the greatest players of all time and you were you know, four in the world and a Wimbledon champion and your career got cut short. We look through Edberg, we look at Becker, we look, in, in our era at least, the real true servant volley players, it, 
it was difficult for them to play well in their late 20s because physically you just can't keep it up. Yeah. And with the elimination of that type of game, to a large extent, there's still a little bit of it around. And you need it now because even guys like Murray, Djokovic, Federer has always done it a little bit. And uh, Murray, they, they come in more than they were three or four years ago because they're learning to finish points more quickly. Maybe not serve and volley, but they're looking to move forward. But the serve and volley was a difficult game physically to be able to do. And I think part of the reason why we're seeing players, they become smarter with their training. And I think they're also able to employ a lot more people around them now. That yeah. can, longevity, they have physio, their own physio on the road, their own masseuse. Their diets are much better than what they used to be. They've become smarter trainers. They're not doing the four or five hour sessions on the court training that like we used to do. And if you weren't training four or five hours a day, you weren't training hard enough. Football players are not doing that amount of time on the court. Do you think days. that's a good thing? I think they're, they're protecting their bodies more now because they're doing different training off the court to keep the strength, but also to make sure that they're making their core stronger for when they do go onto the court. Well, this is one of the questions that has come up. Uh, has come up recently with a lot of players defaulting the U.S. Open um, and players just pulling out of tournaments. Is you know, I initially you see you see that you go and McEnroe made the comment as well. I said, you know, why are they defaulting in these tournaments? You know, you should never default. I mean, you and I, we're hobbling around on one leg. We'd you'd never finish the match. You'd never you'd, you'd finish the match, but. I look at it and go, well... Were we smart well, doing that? Were we smart doing that? You're finished at 20, you know, you're 26. I was, you know, I had three a dozen knee surgeries as well by the time I was 30. Yeah. You know, is it smart? Is it, or is it a bit, a bit, are they a bit wimpy? Or well, or is it maybe a, a, or a combination of both? Or, or I don't know. I, I think it's the era in which you're brought up in and the way you were brought up to train. Now, we both came from Australian rules football backgrounds mm. and a little bit of pain was meant to fight. You, you were meant to fight through it. Yeah. You weren't supposed to listen to your body. Mm. If you felt pain, that was normal yeah. and you keep going. Players today are different. They listen to their bodies much more than what we used to, especially much more than I used to do. And that's not looked upon as being weak. <laughs> it's looked upon as being smart. Yeah. And to a large extent, I think they're right. Look, I think there are occasions when players could push through it a little more than what they do, but they are looking to protect themselves a lot more these days than they used to. And and I think it's part of the reason why we're seeing longer careers. Mm. Um, on the flip side of that, um, Ken Rosewell yeah. went, went on forever. I mean, he wasn't a, he wasn't a huge serve volleyer. That's right. I, I think the way he played allowed him to be able to do Jimmy that. Connors. And he was freaking yeah. Ken, right? Yeah. The, the way he played, the timing he had, the, his yeah. ability to take a ball from any place in the court and just drive it to the corners. Yeah. I remember a great story, you probably know this one, Wally Masua just made the semi-finals of the US Open and every time he'd come back to Sydney, he'd pull Ken Rose Hall to hit some balls. Mm. And Kenny must have been in his 50s back then and Wally just came off the semis of the US Open. Ken calls him up and says, well, let's go hit a few balls. And they go out and Ken gets out of his car and it looks like he's got a walking stick. He can barely, <laughs> can barely get to the court. And they get on at the court and Wally's thinking he's going to have to take it easy. And Ken beats it in straight sets, four and four, in a practice match Series. against Wally, who's just come off the semis of the US Open. And then he kind of hobbles back to his car, gets in his car and drives home. It's Ken was right. a freak. The way he played, he, he was freakish. And that's why he was so good for so long. Well, he didn't tell me that one. He hasn't told you that one? <laughs> I love that story. Oh, that's, that's probably true. I mean, Jimmy Connors, I think, was... Uh, much the same way as well. Very, very light. Yeah, yeah. very light. And he it's came into net a lot more at the end of his career than he did at the start. But can, but Rod Laver. I don't know if you've had a read of Rod Laver's book. It's it's, yeah. it's worth having. It's, yeah, it's worth having a, a read. You'll like it because you'll know the names. There's quite a lot of old Aussie names and Dick Creely and all that sort of. You know, Creel's had like uh, he served for the match against against Rocco. In the oh, year, really? Year, yeah. The, when the he won the major won, won, won on the wow. Slam in the French Open. Or, yeah. I think I think that's correct. But anyway. And, uh, and and tightened up, um, yeah. but, but the the early days of the pros where they would play on anything yeah. because they had to sort of have this. There was the, they were they were bad bad named, yeah. you know, around the world as you know just greedy people going up making money and leaving the game, and uh, they felt every time they had to play, they had to play five sets anywhere they went on all sorts of services. They actually played on on ice. They yeah. put a tarmac over an ice rink and played. <laughs> uh, it, it, but they, he, you know he continued. For, for a long time, but uh, I can barely walk now. I'll, 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 I'll rock it. Yeah. But I, you know, I haven't got you forever. I know you've got to go. And um, uh, from men to the women, 
All right, you've now seen the women's game, and it's been a few years since you're on the road with with Andre. You, I know you're you're a, you're a great analyst for ESPN. I uh, love love he- hearing you. You almost take the words out of my mouth when I when I when I hear hear you talk, and uh, of course bring a bit of class to the to the Americans. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the ESPN. Um, this interview is just going to the Aussies. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course, of course. Um, but uh, you, so you obviously you, you still see that you still see, see the men's game, and but yeah. now you're literally on the circuit with the women's, yeah. and you decided not to commentate Correct. on the women's yeah. game because you felt it's a conflict of interest. Yeah. So where do you see the development? How do you see the development in the women's game in the last few years? I mean, obviously Serena and the Williams sisters brought in this new element of power and fitness. Um, where do you see the girls well, like, compared think, to the guys? I suppose. No, I think a lot of the women have taken a leaf out of a lot of the professionals on the men's side as well. You, you see the teams they've built around. You see Novak's team, you see Federer's team and the way they're training and they pay attention. And Serena's led the way the last five or six years. I, I know she's been a champion for many more years than that, but the, what she's done in the last five or six years when she's entered her 30s yeah. has been remarkable. And the way she's trained and her professionalism, um, you either have to step up and be just as professional, work just as hard, and work just as smartly, otherwise you get left in her in her wake. And that's yeah. what happened for the first few years. And the last couple of players have started to catch up. They've worked hard. They have great teams around them. I think you've seen more consistency also with the coaching situations mm-hmm. the last couple of years where players know the big picture and know what they're working on and know the goals they're trying to achieve. And they're being a little you more stability, patient. You mean the, the, the right. patient with their coaches exactly. say, okay, let's look at the long term mm-hmm. instead of a quick fix. Exactly. And I think that's paying dividends. And I think the whole standard of the women's game is improving. Serena's still the, the catalyst. I know she's number two at the moment, but she's only played eight, nine tournaments so far this Not year. Not here, unfortunately. And she won Wimbledon. She made two finals and a semi-final in four majors. She still had a remarkable year. Maybe not remarkable by her standards, but by any normal person. <laughs> Anybody still would a, take that. Still a remarkable day. year. And Angie Kerber has stepped up and, and 28 years of old age, taken her game to a whole new level through sheer hard work, determination. She's become mentally stronger. Um, she's day in, day out. She's there, ready for the competition every day. And I think they are examples that everyone holds on to. And so for the rest of the field, um, that, that's what you aim to achieve. And you can only get better from that. Mm. Um, what about tactics? I mean, for, for me, the girls, uh, um, I, I hear this a lot from girls the, the, about the women's and about the men's as well. Is it's one pace, slam, 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 yeah. hitting, hitting the ball. Um, is... Is that, a, is that a fair assessment? Uh, is is the, are the women looking at the men and saying, actually, that, there's a shot I can take on. I should be able to hit a clean yeah. winner out of this. I mean, you've got guys who can just run hot. Yeah. Um, obviously, they don't have to serve. But a lot of the time, they can't serve their way out of trouble. I, I would argue that tactically, they have to be smarter than the men because they don't have a weapon that can finish points. Mm. And, and that's kind of why you see a lot of the nerves and the tension and the drama come into a lot of their matches because... As you know, a guy can get an early break in the third set, be leading three games to one, and then can relax on the return games knowing that he can pretty much coast to the finish line by serving well if you've got that rhythm. Yeah. You can rely on one weapon to get you to the finish line. Mm. Now, everybody but Serena can't rely on that weapon. So how are you going to win a match? Yeah. You have to be tactically smart. You have mentally, to be mentally tough. strong. Yeah. Yeah, and you have to work your way through every single point and a few dodgy moments because there's a good chance you'll have to face a couple of break points and so you have to be very secure in the game plan, what you're trying to achieve. And I would argue that tactically they have to be a little smarter than the the men in many occasions. Not always, but in many occasions. So no, I think that's a unfair statement to the women's game. Uh, I think that it's a great game. I think that you don't have to go out there and play best of five just to make it as interesting. You can play best of three and be just as interesting. Uh, we can get into that whole prize money issue if you want. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a good argument. And it's, it's a fun one, but I love the women's game, and I'm lucky. I'm working with a, a great player. She's a good person, Simona. She goes at it every day like it's an opportunity to get better, and I couldn't ask for a, a better player to work with, so yeah. I'm extremely happy. Yeah, good. She seems to be a good hard worker. Yeah. yeah. She's, got a, she's got an old soul as well. She looks at tennis a little bit like an Aussie. I know she's Romanian. She's got that fire in the belly, and, and sometimes the emotions can get in the way, but she's getting better at that. But she's got a bit of an old soul with what she's trying to accomplish out there and 
you know, the Aussies, we hung together and we, uh, we ate together, we practiced together, we supported each other, and it's kind of what you have in Romanian tennis at the moment as well. She has a lot of good players around her that whilst they are competitive and pushing each other, they're all pretty good friends, so they mm. have a pretty good situation. Mm. Um, let me touch, what do you think about the, uh, uh, the, the idea of shortening the women's game? Steve Simon, yeah. CEO of WTA, suggested that this is a way forward. Uh, for me, there's, there's two ways to look at it. One, you've got to make it more attractive mm. for TV. I mean, that's, it's huge. It's the girls are out sure. there to make money uh, and, and be successful. Um, the, other, the other side for me is yeah, maybe the shorter points maybe takes away the challenge, but certainly the ad, yeah. ad side takes I think, away the challenge. But I, I think the scoring of the game, best of five and best of three, best of five for the men and the majors, best in three, should never be messed with. I don't believe it. Okay, tiebreaker in the final set at some of the slam, no problem. But the scoring, I would never mess with it. Because I think a lot of the drama and the best matches we remember are those classic fifth set encounters that take three or four hours, and they are the ones that stand out in our minds. You would never want to lose that. Some of the great women's matches that take three hours, and you have this unbelievable final set. Okay, to get there, you've got to go through a certain amount of time. If you're going to clean up the game, I would start with about 20 of the rule changes, with getting the players on court, with getting the start at a certain time, instead of having a one o'clock start and they don't play first ball until 1.22 and you have 22 minutes of dead TV waiting for the players to regrip their grip or go to the toilet when they go onto the court before they even start uh, having 45 seconds in between points, putting a shot clock on the court. You know, all the stuff that's going to quicken up the game, uh, there's about 20 rule changes with calling a trainer when you're down 3-1 in the third set and love 30, and then the trainer comes out and holds up play for 12 minutes. Yeah. There, are, there are many different rules. That I, I bet that drive, does that drive you nuts? Does it drive me yeah, nuts yeah. being yeah. an old no, warrior? Absolutely. So I think there are many of those rules, and there's about 15 or 20 of them that we can all get together, the four majors, the WTA, ATP, and the ITF, and they can come up with one consistent rule book that everybody understands and everybody knows, and then the game itself will become much faster and much cleaner, and people will know the rules, and it will only take a number of weeks before the players understand the rules and they'll go with it. You know, it's like this 25 second rule. You have 25 seconds on the ATP tour in between points. It's 20 seconds at the majors and some of the women's tournaments are 20 seconds. Well, no one knows. And sometimes you don't know if you're going 45 seconds before you get a code violation for a, a slow play. We have to clean up those rules. Mm -hmm. And once we clean up those rules and keep play moving along, I think we'll see much quicker times for all of the matches. I wouldn't mess with the best of three or best of five. Yeah, I, I think, personally, I, I, I see both sides of it. I see the excitement of sudden death, but also yeah. the beauty of tennis is that add, the scoring system is a fantastic score, yeah. scoring system. Um, dropping the let. Yeah. I mean, why, why isn't that? Why is so it still do you want to go back to... Why is it still... Really you right? want to go back to quickening up play. Go back to some of the old tapes when the, the older guys, the guys with Labour and Rosewall and Gonzales and these guys, they never used to sit down at the change of ends. They used to take five seconds in between points. Those guys could run and were just as fit as the guys today. They were animals on the court. So if they could do it... That's that a really... misconception. Yeah. You know, the people think, oh, the old the guys in the McEnroe got upset about this. They said, I'm so sick of hearing yeah. the players are fitter and stronger. Yeah. If the players these days are saying that they're fitter and stronger, yeah. but I don't know if they're... No way. I, I would put Bjorn Borg with any of the players today. Absolutely. And I'm pretty sure he could run just as fast, just as long as anybody. And that's no disrespect to Novak or Rafa or Roger or these guys. Borg was a freak. Yeah, he was a, a freak. A good one. <laughs> he, he was indeed. Um, all right, not going to hold you much longer, mate. But I like it. You've seen, uh, you've been a, obviously a, a, pro, a pro tour player. You've been successful on the on the circuit. You've been, uh, you've got a handful of singles titles, more than a handful of doubles titles. Most of them with Kratz, isn't it? Yeah. Mark yep. Kratzman. Yep. So you must, be a, you must be a heck of a player to be able to win <laughs> and beat Kratz. Uh, I actually won one with Fitzy as well. Did, that, that, that was an effort in itself. Did you? Yeah, Fitzy carried yeah. me to a Sydney International doubles time. Oh, yeah. Fitzy. Well, both hands of Fitzy. I've played a lot of matches yeah, with Fitzy. Yeah. Now, how good he is. Um, just proves how good a player we were. Yeah. Carry <laughs> Fitzy. Carry Fitzy. Um, but you've also, been, you've also been a coach back home, and you've seen, you know, as we talked about Leighton going through. Is there a... I'd just to pick a, a couple of things where young players or and parents who of young players hoping to be for their kids to come through. Um, 
or maybe coaches who are at a tennis academies, where would you focus as or maybe a couple of things that is, is the most things that you absolutely have, have to get right if you want to be a, a pro player? You've got to get your technique right, and especially on your serve. If you have a poor serve, you're going to struggle to make it in the men's game especially. So I think technique, a good throwing action, is incredibly important. I think the coaches are becoming smarter these days where they're learning from other sports like baseball and the throwing sports, mm. and even American football, mm. uh, where you're keeping that elbow up and you're getting a more stronger throwing action, which helps the serve. Technique is really important. But I think that trying to master not everything in one practice session. I think a lot of coaches go out there and you address everything every single practice session. So. I think the idea at the moment is to pick one or two things that are really important to work on and have the player go over those one or two things and feel like after an hour on the court, you've addressed one or two things and you've walked off feeling like you're better at that on that particular day instead of trying to hit everything great. So it might be you know, backhand cross court you're having a little bit of trouble with. Spend all day on the backhand cross court. When you walk off the court, you're starting to get the feeling of it. And if you do that every day, every practice session where you just address one or two things and be very specific about what you're trying to improve, you'll look back in six months and go, oh my God, I've come a long way. Mm. But when you group it all together and walk onto the court and keep addressing everything every single day, it's difficult to make real progress. And I think that's kind of my coaching philosophy with Leighton, with Andre, with Simona, with the Adidas players is that, okay, what are we working on today? And whether that's my choice or whether that's the player's choice, we try to be very specific about where that improvement's going to come from. And I think a lot of coaches, and especially parents, they want to see the player master everything. Mm. And it's impossible to do that in one practice session. So be more specific. A bit more patience. Yeah, for sure. Um, the, you did the Adidas, uh, you worked with the Adidas guys in, in Vegas. Um, yep. I'm guessing... I believe that came about through through Andre, through your connections with Andre. No, um, that was through, um, I was with Adidas as a kid. I've been with Adidas all my life. And so they'd already set up the play development program when Andre had finished his career. And then uh, I did a couple of things for the first year after Andre uh, finished. And then Adidas approached me to see if I'd be interested in joining them. Uh, Sven Gronefeld was already yeah. a coach with the player development program. And I was kind of the US base. And then with Gil Reyes doing the strength and conditioning, they asked if both of us would join. And uh, it was great. For seven or eight years, I got a chance to work with and spend time with a, a bunch of Adidas players, both male and female. And also, more than anything, I got to keep my relationship with Gil Reyes, mm. who I'm not sure if you spent time with him, but not a lot. he's a special man. Mm. Uh, there's not many people that you sit down with and, and you spend time with and you walk away from spending time with Gil and you feel better about yourself because he has a, a special way with words. You know, he's a, he's a huge man and he can be a little bit intimidating looking at him. Mm. He's really a gentle giant and he makes you feel better about yourself. And for an athlete to get that feeling every time you step into the gym to work with him, you know, sometimes you might go in there and you might not lift a single weight. You might just sit down and talk with him for an hour and a half about life, about tennis, about a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It could be anything. Mm. But he has a, a special way with words. And for me to spend another seven or eight years working with him, that was a real pleasure mm. for me. Mm. Um, there's so many questions I want to ask you. But speaking of Gil, where have you seen, and, and you see the trainers now, uh, Simona's got her own trainer. You'll see the other trainers working with players. Yeah. Uh, where have you seen much change, or where would you be uh, looking at doing more of, yep. shall we say, yep. um, these days with a, with a modern player yeah, as far as physical? I know Gil did, did pump some heavy weights. Yep. Um, is it is it still believing that, or do you think it's more? Is it slightly changed? I, I think having a little bit of knowledge on strength and conditioning can be a dangerous thing. So I feel like I know a little bit, but if I was to take charge on that area of my player, it would be dangerous for my player. Mm. So I leave that to the experts. What I see from someone like Gil is that strength builds core, builds protection. Uh, it protects, and especially around the legs, around the backsides, around the stomach. If you're not strong there, then you can't last playing at the level the players need to play at. So he spends a lot of time not only working on, and you can only do that with doing smart work, but also it's got to be heavy. You, you've got to lift some heavy weights. You've got to do some, some real tough gym sessions. You don't get it easily. If, if it was easy, everybody could do it. So it's got to be tough. And Gil not only does it in a way that makes it interesting, makes it fun, 
but he also protects the athletes and he listens to the athletes. So and that's more important than anything. It would go back to what you and I were talking about. When we were hurting in the gym, our trainers would push us through it. Come on, it's only pain, push through it. Mm. It's not so much it's like that bad. anymore. You, yeah. It's more about, okay, where is the pain coming from? What type of pain is it? Is mm. it pain? Is it soreness? Is mm. it just an ache? They ask more questions these Knowing days. Your body. Exactly. They understand the body. And okay, there are times you do need to push through it if you can work out what type of pain it is. But if it's pain that's setting back the body, boom, the, the, the workouts get shut down. You recover, you come back the next day, and you're better for it. Whereas back in our day, it wasn't so much like that. It was a little bit of that meant tough, tough exactly. Aussie drill, yeah. you know, stop whing- whinging yeah. type. And, and type I'm not of saying stuff. it's bad. I, for me, uh, I don't think I would have been a decent tennis player if I was a pretty skinny little kid when I was 16, 17, so I needed it. So for me, it wasn't bad, but and that was the mentality. And if I didn't have that mentality, there, w- there wouldn't have been a lot of the matches I wouldn't have gutted out yeah. as well. So yeah, there was some good and bad to it. It just meant I had a shorter career than I would have liked. Mm. Well, kill that look. This uh, go on forever, but I want to th- thanks very much, mate, for your, for your time. And uh, yeah, I might do uh, part two in uh, six months. Let's, let's work up to part ten. It'll be good. <laughs> yeah.